I get a phone call from a friend of mine. He um, asks me, would I do have all the penalty kicks of all the players of Manchester United? I say, yes. Okay, uh, would you be willing to work a little bit for Chelsea? I say, okay, how come? I say, well, it happens that I'm a good friend with um, Avram Grant. Avram Grant is the coach that replaced Mourinho. And as you know, these guys are playing in two, three weeks' time um, the Champions League final. I say, okay, that's interesting. Uh, could you do the test that you typically do with this data and tell us what happens? I say, yes, I can do that. I'll be pleased to do that. So, okay, I get the data. I work for a couple of weeks and I write a report, which I send to my friend, a famous mathematician that works in Israel and in New York. And um, I send the same report to the coach. The coach on Monday says, well, this is absolutely fantastic. Hopefully, we are not going to uh, need it. Hopefully, we'll beat Manchester United uh, in the first 90 minutes. But if it happens that we go to extra time and then to the shootout, uh, this will be very, very useful. Okay, so guess what? Champions League final, they end up 1-1. Uh, they go to extra time, they continue 1-1. There's a penalty shootout. Okay. Now, my reports uh, tested for certain aspects that should happen if rational players play this game. Okay? Um, if they play correctly, there should be very little arbitrage opportunities there. If they don't, actually, should, um, you should systematically, at least in a statistical sense, take advantage of, of certain players. It happens that there were two players in Manchester United that had a very strong bias. The first one was the goalkeeper, Van der Sar. Van der Sar had not a perfect, but a very strong tendency to move to the right-hand side when facing a right-footed uh, kicker, and towards the left when facing a left-footed kicker. Uh, the second player was Cristiano Ronaldo. He was uh, almost perfect, except if he stopped in the run-up to the ball. If he did that, it was almost certain that he would kick to the right. Okay, so this is exactly what happened. In uh, the third penalty kick, first, but of course, uh, knowing what Van der Sar was doing, uh, my Chelsea players score all of the penalty kicks. And in the third penalty kick, uh, my goalkeeper, uh, Peter Seck, stopped uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. So in the fifth penalty, I was in a position to win myself the Champions League final for Chelsea with some data and some math. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the fifth penalty, John Terry slept. As predicted, Van der Sar went to the right. Totally unpredictable, John Terry slept, he kicked to the left, and just barely missed, hit the post and went out. There it went my chance to win the Champions League final. Then there was a sixth penalty, and in the seventh penalty, Anelka totally disregarded the advice of the data. He kicked to the right, which is, as we knew, uh, what Van der Sar tends to do against right-footed players. Van der Sar stopped the ball. Manchester United won the Champions League final. So at this point, you may think, how on earth a professor in economics at the Wood School has 11,000 penalty kicks? Is this guy not working? <laughs> Does he do any research at all? Only watches football? Does he do any teaching? How on earth is this guy? The answer has to do with, um, with Galileo. I have lots of penalty kicks because it is very good data, the same as Galileo Galilei had very good data from apples that he dropped from the Pisa Tower. Or uh, a few years later, Sir Isaac Newton also got data from apples. So apples and stones provided very good data for these guys to test theories that were of interest to them. Not because they care, not because they care about penalty kicks, sorry, about, not because they care about penalty kicks, uh, about any type of theory. They care about, about not inherent data, they care about loss of gravity. And yet, the, um, the data from apples and stones was terrific uh, to test for the first time some theories that were important to physics. Economics, actually, economics is a social science, but is not characterized by the subject matter. 
It is characterized, as Gary Becker says, by the approach that we take to things, whether it's in sociological questions, political science questions, anthropological questions, um, any type of questions. Okay, because it is applicable to any type of human behavior, it means that any type of human behavior could be potentially very useful to test theories. The same as apples and stones data was very good to test uh, theories um, for this uh, famous uh, scientist. Um, so what type of theories can you test with penalty kick data? If you watch the movie, A Beautiful Mind, it turns out that uh, John Nash got the Nobel Prize in 1994, then they made a movie, uh, but there was a subset of his theories that had remained untested for many years. Those are the theories that involve mixing among optimal strategies. And they had remained untested because it's very hard. It is very hard, typically the real world is very dirty. You have 20 banks, 30 firms, uh, 100 countries, a bunch of individuals playing, you have many strategies available to them. It's very hard to find good data, like uh, with apples and stones. Okay? But the penalty kick is ideal. Only two agents, and always in the same position. So some of these theories had remained untested. It occurred to me that this type of data was ideal. After some math, you solve for the Nash equilibrium, and it turns out that it has some predictions. Football players should do something. Okay? They should do, uh, the goalkeepers should do left and right in certain proportions, 42-58. The, le the kicker should do 38-61. And actually, somehow miraculously, football players do that. Not all of them, but most of them do that. Which is kind of shocking. You would think, how on earth football players that never came to a university like this, don't even have high school, follow these laws? For the same reason that apples and stones do not know the laws of gravity, and yet they follow these laws of gravity. And you can check as a group, as a, once you have 1,000 penalty kicks, but you can check individually. You can check, you can check uh, Messi, uh, Duriz, you can check uh, Ronaldo, goalkeepers, Casillas, Iraizos, you can check anybody. And check whether, in fact, people are behaving as Nash would predict. In fact, they do, but not always, as, uh, as I uh, uh, noted uh, earlier uh, with Van der Sar and, and Ronaldo. Now, uh, so this is an instance that it doesn't take the economic approach to human behavior in this direction. It's the other way around. Any type of human behavior could be useful. So it's not what economics can do for football. It's the other way around. It's what football can do for economics, like what apples and stones can do for you. Okay, so this is the first message I wanted to convey today. The second is a more standard approach, which is still is very rare today in, in academic research, which is what an economist can do for any type of human behavior. Why not for sports? Maybe you have seen the movie Moneyball. Moneyball is a movie that is fantastic in the following sense. It revolutionized, in the last 15 years, the sports industry in the US. And barely touching now the European industry. Why this guy hired an economist, the economist with some data, some methodologies, uh, started analyzing behavior, and somehow was able to assess much better, to identify much better talent than just with instincts. Okay, as a result, there were some biases and arbitrage opportunities that he took advantage of. So let me give you three examples. Three examples of how an economist can make contributions to sports. Example number one. You may remember in 2002, uh, a psychologist for the first time, and some of my friends say it for the last time, they gave a Nobel Prize to a psychologist, okay, to Danny Kahneman, okay, for his contributions detecting biases. He detected many biases. Some biases um, are very important, not all of them, some of them, and they deserve a Nobel Prize. It is very hard uh, to find conclusive evidence, even if we suspect that there is a force that moves the apples from the tree to the stone. Even we suspect that we humans are biased, it's very hard to actually document clearly the sources and the identities of bias. If we go back to penalties, actually, um, and to my surprise, um, um, not single penalties, but penalty shootouts, like in the Chelsea Manchester United, uh, people think that, or people say, even today, that it is a lottery. Everybody has the same chances, 
five kicks each, it's a 50-50 lottery. The word lottery remembers, reminds us of a 50-50. Well, if you look at the data, and it takes a long time to collect lots of data because of, of the needs of statistical power, and we need lots of data, turns out that it is not a 50-50 lottery. It is a 60-40 lottery. Okay? Who begins, who follows, is randomly determined by coins. So it's perfectly identified the source of, of this asymmetry. Okay, some t A team is given an arbitra arbitrarily a greater chance to be leading, and another team is being um, given a greater chance to be lagging. Why? Uh, because, presumably, this leading lagging asymmetry affects performance. It is probably better to be leading than to be lagging and trying to play catch up. So this is uh, an economist looking at the data this way could identify a bias in a very clean uh, setting. What else can we do as an economist? Actually, we can fix the bias or attempt to fix the bias. These days, the current order is, let's say that there are two teams, A and B. First kicks A, then B, then A, then B, A, B, A, B. But if the order A, B gives an advantage to anybody, let's say it gives an advantage to A, what should we do in the next pair of penalties? We should reverse the advantage to try to compensate for what happened in the first pair. By the way, what happens if the advantage of A comes, uh, uh, goes to B? The same, we should reverse in the next pair to compensate any advantage given to anybody. By reversing the order in the next pair, we are compensating any type of advantage. And by, the, and by the way, if there was no advantage in the order AB, by reversing, we're doing nothing. So it is a win-win proposition to actually uh, change the order. And then let's repeat. ABBA, ABBA, ABBA. Do you know any sport that uses this structure? First one, then two, 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 until a team or an agent or a player wins. Of course, tennis. Tennis uses that structure. Presumably, they realized a long time ago that uh, leading, serving gives you a greater chance to be leading, and leading affects performance. So, I don't know if you noticed, but three weeks ago, even though in the Spanish media was not seen a lot, three weeks ago, March 3rd, FIFA announced, and it was covered in England, in Germany, in France, in the US, big time. FIFA announced that they are implementing this system. They are going to be moving from the A, B, A, B, A, B to a tennis tiebreak. Okay, so this is something else that an economist can do, identify a bias and try cor to correct the bias, if we think like an economist. Very difficult sometimes, these things don't happen every year or every decade, but it's doable. Second example, closer to us. Let's see what an economist would think. We have to move 36,000 people, season ticket holders, socios, from the old San Mames to the new San Mames. Everybody thinks it's going to be better off. Okay, it's a better stadium. Well, and plus, by the way, I want to be seated with my friends and family around me. By the way, the guy sitting right by me also wants to be seated with his friends and family around him. Impossible. It's impossible. So here we have to devise a system. Oh, by the way, we are not going to buy or sell seats in the new stadium. We are going to allocate seats in the stadium. So we are not going to use prices or contracts, or we are not going to allow trading. It's impossible. No prices, no contract, no trading. We just have to think of an allocation. Turns out that this problem is identical in a mathematical structure to what Alvin Roth Nobel Prize in Economics in 2012 has studied. He has studied many problems where you have to match donors and recipients, okay, donors uh, for kidneys. You have to match uh, hospitals to residents. You have to match public housing among different, different types of people without using prices because we don't want to trade kidneys. We don't try to uh, trade organs. Okay, so we have to allocate it as close as possible to market efficiency. 
Okay, this is this is the type of research that got the Nobel Prize to Alvin a few years ago. Using the by the way, using this type of algorithms, we devise um, an algorithm to move people from one stadium to the other. Out of these thirty-six thousand people, we got sixty complaints. Less than two per thousand. Okay, these matching algorithms work very well to solve an important problem in this. In this, uh, in this company, in this club. Third and final example. Um, coming back to San Mames, a technical question. Okay, technical question that economists could solve. We are going to play for one season in a U-shaped stadium. You remember, there was the old stadium, was the new stadium being built, and for one season it was a U-shape. Question. Does this asymmetric stadium impact performance? If it does, we have to take advantage of that study, if it does, and choose accordingly. Now, we studied for a couple of weeks, uh, uh, maybe around 100 hours, data from a similar stadium, Rayo Vallecano, that also has a U-shape, to estimate whether or not Potentially, a U-shape asymmetry in the stadium might impact performance. What we found was very interesting. We found that always attacking in the first half towards the goal that does not have any people could create around 1.5 to 2 uh, points per season. What did we need? Serious econometrics that people we use uh, we study in, um, uh, in economics courses. Now. Is that a lot? Is that a very little? We don't know. But Athletic produces points at more or less 1 million per point. The budget is around 65 million euros for the first team. A good season is around 60 to 65 points. Okay, so attacking, and we, by the way, we managed to attack almost 90% of the games, the first half against the goal without people, and the second half against the goal with, uh, peop um, the goal with people. Um, is worth around 2 million euros. And by the way, that season we reached the final, so we reached the Champions League uh, for the first time in the last 15 years. So these are instances of both ways, economics, um, uh, what economics can do for football and what football can do for economics. What the sports can do for economics, what economics can do for sports. Beautiful game, theory, beautiful economics. Thank you very much. Thank you.